Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Neve Niku, and this is uh, Gear. Uh, we're here today to talk about uh, Fubo TV and how they become a, a great streaming provider in under 24 months with uh, Google Cloud. So uh, just a little more background. I'm a customer engineer uh, with Google Cloud in New York uh, in the media entertainment division. Uh, so we're focused uh, with partnering with media entertainment clients. I come from uh, doing this in the on-premise world uh, and then moving to cloud. So kind of have a, a good background in this space. I don't know if. Oh, and I'm the uh, CTO of, of Fubo TV. Uh, come to this from uh, so an advertising background and a video background. If you remember uh, a company called Juiced some number of years ago, we were trying uh, something similar. So just a quick agenda uh, today. Uh, we're going to go a little bit into uh, kind of video distribution, uh, different problems and considerations uh, that we see in the market today. Then we'll kind of talk about Google Cloud's offerings to that. Um, there's a couple different solution pathways that we can go. Uh, and then we'll talk about uh, kind of Fubo and their case study and kind of their approach uh, to, to streaming and go into you know, how they were successful, what their architecture is, uh, best practices, and kind of talk about their timeline to current date and then some exciting stuff uh, that they're going to be doing this year and moving forward. So. So why is live video so difficult? How many people here have watched uh, any type of video stream and it's been buffering and you've waited on either a phone, a browser? Yeah, I would say everyone, right? Um, so like why and is For those that? that haven't, have you just not looked at video on the internet? <laughs> yeah, so uh, this, is a, this is a really hard problem to solve actually and there's a lot of things to consider. So. Just real quick to kind of uh, level set and kind of get a, a good picture of what's going on. So with uh, live, live video distribution, right, there's kind of these different components that you have. Uh, so first you have to actually acquire all of your different signals, right? So this can be via satellite, camera, fiber, right? There's many different ways to do so. Um, then, you know, you're going to take that into an MPEG transport stream and you're going to, you know, do a, a bunch of processing, encoding, transcoding, Right, having your digital rights management, logos that are needed, right, and kind of get the, get the video stream ready to actually deliver. Then now, how do I actually deliver this globally? Right? So I need, to, I need to partner with many CDN providers to then get, get and distribute this to all the different types of devices. Right? So this is a really, 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 I'll just keep saying that, high level of kind of the end-to-end -end video distribution workflow. We'll go into more detail and technical depth um, but I just kind of wanted to set the stage, right? So what are kind of all the different things that we have to consider? So this has been an industry that's been around for quite a number of years. Um, broadcast, right, this has, been, this has been done via satellite where I have a set fixed amount of bandwidth and there's just been new protocols that have come out, you know, every five, 10 years or so um, that's basically compressed the data, right? So how much, how much data can I fit with a, with a fixed bandwidth rate, right? Now there's many different devices. So that brings a bunch of different problems. And when I'm sending video over the internet, I have to account for all the different devices, the different video formats that are needed based on the device that I have for the picture quality, right? And in that workflow, in order to do that, there's so many different partners that you're going to have to actually go through with. So like in Fubo's uh, case, right? Like they have to acquire all these different types of content from many different providers, right? So there's CBS, there's Fox, there's all the different sports streams. And that's just on the content part, right? Not even including the, you know, who they choose to partner with on the video processing side, the CDN side, et cetera, right? So there's many different parts and many different uh, companies that are in the entire workflow that can really, you know, make this a pretty tough problem to actually solve. And then not to say how much bandwidth there is, right? So there's different bandwidth at each part in that workflow. And then at the end device, right? Like I can have really poor internet because I'm a cheap guy, right? I only have 20 megabits per second. How am I going to get high quality video compared to somebody who's paying for the one gigabit line, right? So there's many, many different problems that we see. And then the coverage area globally, right? So there's going to be people where there's may maybe not infrastructure that is really best served in that area. So how can I serve someone in you know, the middle of nowhere versus a large metropolitan city? So these are all kind of different things that we have to consider when uh, distributing live video. 
So where can Google help? So we have the largest cloud network. I had to show the beautiful scaled slide that you've probably seen in 15 other different presentations. But in all seriousness, we have uh, an, an extremely impressive network, over 100 points of presence. And we really, we really think this can help with scaling large video, right? We have many different applications that I'm sure we all use. Um, and so we, we really think we help with scale, uh, especially with uh, live video distribution. So there's a couple different solution pathways that you can go um, when trying to solve uh, the problem of live video distribution. So kind of the spectrum is uh, infrastructure as a service, kind of you see it on the left hand side, um, all the way to kind of software as a service. So we've seen uh, multiple uh, clients and partners of ours kind of do both. It just kind of depends where you want to turn the different knobs, right? So on the right hand side, we have a, a product suite called Envato which is our video processing um, and kind of uh, video processing uh, suite. Uh, we've seen uh, NBC and CBS kind of use this before. Um, and then on the left, we see different partners such as Fubo, who use our infrastructure as a service uh, solution set. So using different things like GKE, uh, Compute Engine, uh, and, and, and other, uh, other GCP offerings uh, that we've seen. So it just depends. Infrastructure as a service gives you kind of the most flexibility uh, in your deployment, right? And you can kind of really control different parts in the video distribution workflow. Whereas software as a service kind of gives you what you need, but you have a little bit less control on that, right? And we kind of see this with a bunch of cloud offerings today with serverless, right? And then also, you know, compute engine. So there's just different methodologies that you can do so. And I think that's kind of what makes cloud a really unique and fun place to be. We kind of give you the tool sets and you kind of can choose what makes the most sense for you and your business and your application. So. I've kind of set the stage talking about you know, what the problem is, um, different things that you, know, you have to consider throughout the video distribution workflow, um, and kind of the different offerings we think that uh, GCP can help with. Uh, now I'm going to hand it over to Gear to kind of talk about uh, you know, Fubo, uh, their journey on GCP, and the reason that they chose the specific architecture and different components that they did. This thing was getting annoying. Thank you. Do you want you. me to click the signs in? Sorry? You want me to click the slides or you got no, it? I can click the slides. All right. And if you, you can, if you want to click the slides. No, it's, it's up. I'm flexible. So um, how many of you are uh, cord cutters that, that get your TV consumption not from your uh, bandwidth provider? All right, so some, some number of you. Um, marketing always hates when I do this, but how many of you are Fubo customers? All right, great. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm one too. Um, I just look at this as a tremendous potential for our business, right? So um, Fubo is a uh, OTT streaming service. Um, we are sports focused. We call ourselves the world's only sports focused. Um, it really comes from our origin as a provider that was delivering first soccer. And I think the, uh, the name came from a, a riff on, on football, right? Um, what we do is we deliver both live television and VOD um, to you. And when we say live television, these are the channels uh, that you would get from any other provider, uh, Fox, Turner, um, et cetera. Um, sports stations like, like B in Sports, um, you'll get NBCSN, NBC stations. We have uh, locals, um, so just your local television affiliates for, for Fox, uh, NBC. We also have regional sports nets, so I don't know if, uh, like Nesson in Boston or, or SNY in New York um, for, your, for your local sports. Um, and it's available on, on pretty much anything that you would want to show it on. We, we are trying to make a really great in-home experience so you can get it to your smart TV or your, your various TV connected devices like an Apple TV or Fire TV. Um, but you can also get it on the web. You can also get it on mobile devices um, pretty much anywhere you want to be as long as there's bandwidth. Um, so a little bit of our backstory. We'll get into some technical things in a moment. Um, the original product vision was to aggregate VODs for professional football clubs or, or teams, as, as they're called. That's soccer for anyone who's uh, uh, soccer. American. Soccer, yeah, but, sorry. No. Uh, it's a, this foreign sport that's really popular. <laughs> um, what the clubs were doing is they had their, on their website, they would have content specific to their team. So you go to Everton and you can see 
you know, uh, game replays, highlights, interviews, uh, backstory kind of stuff. Um, but you know, it, a lot of a lot of soccer fans like multiple teams. So what the, what Fubo was trying to do was bring it all together in one place where you can get this content for for all of soccer. Um, and it, it didn't quite work because, at least in a market sense, because sports fans like live sports, right? Anybody here is a sports fan? Do you tend to want to watch it live or you're willing to record it and like watch it next week? Live, right? Um, so, so Fubo had to bring in live streaming and while VOD is fairly straightforward um, because you can get the asset ahead of time, you can transcode it, prepare it, you know, quality control, make sure it's, it's a good experience for the consumer, and then put it out in your, in your distribution system. L live is, is kind of a real-time thing, right? It's being broadcast. Um, and when I say live, I'll also use linear interchangeably. Um, for me, live is actually true live when people are out on a field doing something or, um, you know, like, a, like an award show or something where it's actually happening in real time. Um, linear is just the general idea that we have these streams being broadcast at us and they need to be delivered uh, as close to real time as possible. I mean, it cannot be in real time, there's latency. Um, it's just physics uh, and architecture kind of force this. But um, adding this linear stream be became a really big change for the business, both technically uh, and as well um, from, from the perspective of the business. And I'll give a little bit of background on the business. We're, we're a cable company, right? We are no different in some ways than whoever your cable provider is. We have to license the content from, from the content owners uh, Fox, Hallmark, whoever. Uh, and we use that same business model that, that, that the cable companies do, which is we have to pay uh, on a per subscriber basis. Not what's viewed, but just if we have a quarter million subscribers, we will pay quarter 250,000 times whatever the per, per subscriber fee is. Uh, and this makes a pretty tough business because uh, a lot of money goes into uh, purchasing the content or licensing the content. I mean, in fact, in our business, um, we don't quite even break even on subscriber fees. Subscriber fees, plus a little bit more, are given all to the content owners, and our business is about making it up from advertising and, and other content upsells. On the technology side, uh, and this is where we're gonna go into in, in a moment, um, adding linear, uh, it was a really big difference, right? There is, um, the plane is always in the air. Right, you can never stop. Um, you can never pause. Uh, it, it just has to work, and we're competing with a system that, you know, has you know over 70 years of development behind it, and is fairly stable. Right, when you turn on your television on a on a sort of a legacy distribution system, it works, and it works really well. And for us to be successful, we have to deliver that kind of consumer experience, um, without owning the infrastructure, without owning the path the network path to the user, um, and it's, it's a bit of a trick. Apparently my slide changed itself. So why is this hard? Um, I think it's because we're all figuring it out, right? Certainly the content owners, our partners, are figuring it out. We are a different kind of place for content to be pushed to. We have different requirements. Uh, we're in different places, right? We don't have uh, satellite downlink uh, infrastructure. We don't have broadcast centers. We are in the cloud, right? Um, signal acquisition partners are people who specialize in transport of getting it from the content partner to the cloud, right? They are also figuring it out because, um, again, it's kind of a new thing to get into the cloud and to, and to integrate with these, with these other parties. Um, our cloud partners are figuring it out, right? We do a kind of workload that isn't very common in cloud environments. Um, some people think it's a little crazy to do in a cloud environment, but um, with the variability and multi-tenancy that you're going to run into, um, but we make it work. Um, CDN partners, same thing. Um, we're certainly figuring it out. And then consumers also are, are part of the chain. They are effectively part of the distribution system in that their in-home networks uh, are part of the delivery path. Um, they, the different kinds of devices that they, that they would need to, to be able to have a good OTT experience is also something new to them. Um, we'll get to technical stuff in a moment. Um, our timeline is we were founded in 2015, entirely soccer focused. Um, we talked about how we went to VOD adding the linear, but uh, that really wasn't a success in the market either because 
soccer, you know, any sport is sort of limited in terms of time and limited in terms of interest, right? You have your season, baseball season, uh, I guess, which seems to go on forever, uh, like, like hockey. Um, but football season's in the fall, early winter. Um, soccer season is limited. So what we needed to do is to make it um, something that you would subscribe to and, and keep all year round, we had to add other content. Um, the slide keeps changing, I don't know why. But yeah. If I just keep jumping. Um, <laughs> so we added Fox, NBC, we added CBS. So now starting to produce a p content package that's really for the whole family. Um, we launched Advanced DVR, which is kind of a table stakes if you're gonna have an OTT service. Um, hit 100,000 subscribers by the end of 2017. Um, really focused now on, on building a business out of it by adding server-side ad insertion, uh, which is sort of the main monetization driver for the business. Um, what we do is on every stream that's coming to every single user, they're all individual streams and we're able to insert advertising on a per user, per stream basis. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, apparently it's a big event that I joined the place, but I've been there for about a year. Um, we were the first to do 4K streaming OTT, uh, and we did it with uh, the World Cup, which was, which was last year. That's a large event, played mostly by foreigners, soccer. Um, how many people are soccer fans? Okay, so football, knew the World Cup well. was. football and soccer, we're gonna interchange that. Just, we're not confusing anyone, so. Um, we have an a international strategy. We launched into Spain, uh, and then we're, we keep adding new content um, to the package. So, how many people um, know how streaming really works? It's, it's not a continuous stream of bits being sent at you, right? It is really a series of files that are just being loaded over and, and, and buffered and then played at you. So, I'm gonna give this as a background, um, talking about something called HTTP live streaming. It's a very simple protocol. Uh, some would argue one that should never have made it out of the, the uh, design room, um, right? But the way it works is um, you have a source, uh, usually it's a pretty fat source, 30 megabits a second, 50 megabits a second, depending on uh, the quality of it. Um, it is encoded, and why that means is we take that, that sort of mezzanine feed and we turn it into multiple bit rates. So um, there may be a 10 megabit stream, a, a seven, a five, a three, one, 750K, whatever you choose to do is sort of the variant ladder it's called. And the reason why you do that is it allows the player to, based on the trouble it's having loading uh, content, switch to different bit rates to keep continuity of the stream. You're gonna lose quality as the bit rate goes down, but you at least get, a, uh, uh, at least get the experience. Now, what encoding is doing, it's creating little files that are called manifests. It's a text file that is a list of uh, the next series of uh, video segments that are to be played by the player. And then video segments are, are just chunks of video that are being uh, produced and then dropped into storage. Right? So these would be, say, uh, uh, S3 bucket somewhere, or I guess I misspelled. Uh, you spelled Google that Cloud wrong, Store, actually. Right? I misspelled it's, that, it's, right? It's spelled it's actually, GCS, so GCS. yeah. That's but that's all right, that's fine. Um, so what the player's doing is the player's gonna ask for a manifest. They'll say, give me the next manifest takes the manifest and then starts loading the video segments and when it has enough of them, uh, it'll start the playback, but then it keeps this process going while the video is playing, asking for the next manifest. Every four seconds it asks for a manifest um, and these manifests keep getting updated as new chunks are being created off the encoder and playback occurs, right? So this is fundamentally how HLS works and Dash is very similar, it's a different, different standard. Um, but it's basically give me the list of things to do, start playing it, keep fetching, keep giving me the list, and so on. Apple thanks you for your explanation. Yeah, so, yeah, as a call out to, I mean, I feel like I should be selling something here on the floor anyway. <laughs> um, so the, the, you know, the, the obligatory, uh, how this maps into Google services slide. Um, ingestion is, is on the networking infrastructure. Google has an excellent networking infrastructure, so uh, we bring uh, a lot of streams right into us that way. Um, we do the, the encoding or the transcoding using Google Compute. Um, we are dropping into multiple storages for redundancy, multiple regions. And then uh, a delivery network such as uh, you know, Google CDN is used to uh, front the, the origins and uh, devices pull in the, the way we just described um, with the HLS lesson. Now, it's, what we do is a little more complicated than, than the previous slide. Um, <laughs> 
there's a couple of, of pieces of this. We've got sort of third party inputs. Um, that would be uh, content is the biggest one, right? And there's, there's some content providers up there. Um, we get metadata because uh, as part of any television, you want to have a guide, like electronic program guide. So we need to get that information. Um, and that comes from a company called Gracenote. Uh, Tribune Media Services uh, is the subsidiary. Um, there's other kinds of data sources that can come in. Uh, and then there's third party services that we use for mainly sort of non-core things such as subscription management and payments. Um, more on that in a sec. Uh, then inside this big gray box is really what we do. Um, we have, uh, if you can think of the platform divides into a couple of pieces. There's video management and delivery. There is sort of program data and discovery. And then um, program comma data and discovery. And then uh, user and subscription management um, are the three big chunks. And then there's finally the client applications that we also build. Um, so we build uh, apps for, for mobile, we, for, for web, obviously. Uh, and then we're building smart TV app. Samsung is about to, to be released in beta uh, in the next couple of weeks. And then um, Apple TV, the pucks, as I call them, Apple TV, Roku, uh, the sticks, Fire TV, whatever. So what we're doing is actually a lot more complicated than the original HLS slide for, for a bunch of reasons. Um, first of all, we have uh, permissioning and licensing to worry about. And not only is it are you allowed to access content at all, but is very specifically what content. Uh, and a lot of this is based where you are. Um, the two things that fold into this, or the, the primary thing that folds into it, is sports rights management. Um, sports uh, are interesting in that sometimes, depending on the sport, you're allowed to see uh, your home team when you're away. right? So if you're a New Yorker and you're here in San Francisco, um, I think with baseball, it's called couch rights, meaning where your couch is. So if your couch is in New York, you can see anything your couch can see, no matter where you are. I think NFL has something called hotel rules, whereas wherever you physically are. So I couldn't, I was gonna say I couldn't watch the New York Jets, but like, why would I? Um, hey, hey, I'm a- You're a Jets fan? Yes, yes, sadly. All right, this is actually bigger than the talk. We actually found a Jets fan. Yeah. Yeah, that's, a, that's quite, you know, the, the, the joke about, um, it's also like the Mets, right? There's a big sign in New York. It was, you know, welcome to New York, home of nine professional sports teams and also the Mets. Thanks, so um, one of the things we have to do is where you are, create streams that, that switch based on this rights management stuff, right? So, and, and this is, we're going to go into a little bit of depth. When we're creating a video stream, it's actually a personalized stream for you. Every time the player is asking for that manifest, we're not just serving it something out of a, out of a CDN. What we're doing is a rights check, we know who you are, and then we, based on um, switching information that we have on the incoming streams, synthesize a channel for you based on whatever your rights are and whatever you're supposed to see. So every four seconds, we do a computation for you, we get what the manifests are for whatever streams could be contributing to, to what your channel is, and then we write out a manifest specifically for you and return that. So that's really what we talk about when we say the real-time video stream construction, and, and we'll go into that into some depth. Um, we have to manage DVRs. Um, that's a talk unto itself. Uh, the rights metadata um, is, is what I was referring to, is how we construct these streams. Um, encoding and storage. We do some delivery optimization. Um, what we can do is, because we're also, as we're writing this manifest, we have the option of choosing where you get the segment from, right? So if, uh, if, if Google CDN uh, is the, the, the most responsive where you are at that moment, we might write the URLs to pull the segments out of Google CDN, but if you were, maybe Fastly was better for you, we then use Fastly, right? So this gives us the ability to optimize the consumer experience to go for the lowest latency possible. Um, it also gives us the ability to easily steer around a CDN when there's a failure, and you know, like everything else, they fail. Um, program data and discover, program comma data and discovery um, we do a lot in search and personalization. It's something that we've been really focused on and uh, is really a, the area of main focus for us in the consumer experience going forward. Um, we get this metadata, schedule metadata, and we have to process it, normalize it, 
uh, and then make it available to the front ends as well as internal systems um, for channel construction. Um, and then um, subscriber data and, and user management. Um, we're a subscription business direct to consumer. We have to take credit cards. We have to do you know, billing. We use Recurly for that. Um, uh, but, but that's that section. And the only thing I'll add is like, when I was talking about all the different partners and components, like if you look at this slide and just the number, like the number of people, the number of companies that are needed, like this kind of just puts it in perspective like on that slide that I showed how much actually goes into this. And we're gonna go into technical depth on kind of certain components, but this kind of I think puts into perspective like how tough this is and how many moving parts there are. And it gets worse when you add advertising. Right? Yeah. Because at this point, you're producing video stream, yeah. and then you've got to put a layer of, of advertising to personalize uh, each stream. So um, you know, we use GCP stuff. We're at a Google conference. Um, we are primarily uh, Google Cloud, uh, and always have been. Um, it's the wizard. It's the magical wizard. I thought it was the, I thought it was the, uh, I thought they were just trying to move us along here. Um, <laughs> So we use, I, I'm kind of averse personally to sort of the more advanced proprietary offerings that you find in a cloud provider, honestly. Um, so fundamentally, we're there for the compute network and storage, which we find is excellent, right? It's, it's really good stuff. Um, we do use Kubernetes, right? I think the no, no talk here would be complete without somebody mentioning Kubernetes. Um, we do use BigQuery. That is one of those proprietary technologies that uh, we made the decision to go with. Um, it's excellent. Uh, it is sort of the core engine behind uh, everything we do with search personalization, uh, metrics, analytics. Um, we use Cloud Store for um, the, the video segments. Um, we have a lot of stories about that because it is a general purpose storage. And as you can imagine, we want to be able to get the video segments as we receive them from the encoder to disk as fast as possible so we don't lose them. But at the same time, they have to be available for reading immediately. Right, because it's a live stream. So um, we're, we're very sensitive to the latency there. Uh, and then we also use data store as a, really for manifests and historical manifest storage. So uh, I'm not gonna talk about this again. I just wanted to, as a reminder, uh, how HLS works. Um, what we've done is we've taken that previous diagram and made it a little more complicated because of this idea that we have to be synthesizing channels based on um, bunch of factors. One factor I didn't mention is, especially if it's important with sports, is the concept of overtime. Right? Nobody can predict uh, how long a game is really going to go in any sport that allows overtime. So very often what we have to do, and, and most people are watching, with except of things like BN where you're getting uh, sports specific channels, a lot of people consume their sports on your local affiliate, right? your, your local NBC station here in San Francisco. And they have a schedule that comprises local local programming, which might be like source number one, and then there's the national feed, which would be source number two, and, and what we have to do is we need to, we have um, what's called SCSI signaling information that tell us when to switch between streams, so you may have local programming up to the start of a baseball game, uh, and then you switch to the national feed to get the baseball game, and then you might have to switch back once the game is theoretically over, because then there's Judge Judy or whatever's shown. Um, but when you have overtime or extended play like in extra innings, uh, this becomes a problem um, because you do not want to switch back to Judge Judy when uh, the game is going into overtime because that's usually the most exciting part of a game. Uh, and it produces uh, tremendous amounts of ire from your customers, like true, true hate, right? Nothing is worse than, say, dropping off like the third overtime in a hockey game and switching back to the original programming. Like, they, they will come after you. So we have these multiple encoding streams um, that we're storing. And what's happening is this playlist decisioning system is using some of this metadata to decide which source to give you when you ask for a channel. So in terms of a flow, the player is saying uh, to a, an authorization service, hey, can I watch this? And here's my credentials. And, and the, the, the auth service gives it a token back, says, sure, here, give this to the playlist service. Um, the player will then ask the playlist decisioning system, um, I, give, me, give me my manifest uh, for this channel. Uh, the player decisioning system will, will, based on where you are in time and what's supposed to be happening, choose the source stream and provide a manifest to you um, that tells you what the segments are next. It can also rewrite the URLs to get them so we can choose among a set of CDNs that we work with which CDN is going to deliver to you. 
Uh, and then the player says, all right, give me the segment to the right CDN. The CDN then gets it from origin. It's not that interesting, that part. And then, you know, lather, rinse, and repeat. Um, you ask for your next manifest. Uh, the, the player list decisioning system can choose a different stream um, based on whatever's really supposed to, you're supposed to see. Um, and then you may choose even a different uh, CDN because something happened with the first CDN that you were using. Right? So this is uh, really how we produce streams. And, and if you think about it, it means that every single stream that we produce is unique. Right? I mean, they're going to look the same, but they are in theory unique because we are computing them specifically for a given, a given player. Now, this is a business where we take all the money that the consumers give us, and, and then we take some other money that we get from either advertising or VCs, and we give it all to the content owners, right? Um, this is not in itself a sustainable business model. It's, it's a very difficult business. So where the financials come in is um, really advertising is the core monetization for the company. And it, too, is an interesting technical problem. Uh, I used to be the CTO of AppNexus. Um, when I left AppNexus, I thought, okay, I've done my time in advertising. I will never go back to this. Uh, and I find now that really most of my attention is being spent on advertising. And Google knows nothing about advertising. So Sorry? We don't know anything about advertising. Right. And Google, yeah, don't, don't ask about that division of the company. We're here to talk about cloud. Right, right. Um, as we said, it's a, every video stream is, is unique and independent. And that gives us the ability to produce advertising that is unique and independent for each user. Right? This is kind of the, the, the holy grail for advertisers, is to be able to target you specifically. Uh, and it's going to be watched. Right? Unlike a like, say, web, web display, where most of it is <laughs> below the fold anyway, um, th this is something, your TV's up there, right? And this is not a distracting thing in the corner. I mean, I, I'm not going to apologize for how television works. But at some point, you go to a commercial break, and the commercials are shown. Um, so these are ads that are shown. right? There's humans that watch them. So we can determine it in real time. Um, and this is not a new concept for anybody that has been doing advertising in the last 10 years. But for television, it's kind of a new idea. And honestly, the television buyers, the people who are buying advertising for television, don't get it yet. Right? They don't really understand that we can target um, to the individual user. So how does it work technically? So if you remember um, what we talked about before, the player talks to the playlist service, which gets manifests, and the cycle continues. What we do is we put an ad stitcher in front. And what an ad stitcher looks like, it's just a proxy in some ways. And when the player asks for a manifest, the ad stitcher goes to the playlist service, and manifest is produced, and it's returned. Now, as it's coming back, what, to, to get an advertisement, there are cue points. There might be a little line in the manifest that says, cue out here. And you can do it for 60 seconds. That's a 60 second ad break. Now, there still is going to be video segments listed. Those are the video segments on the original stream, right? So that would actually be the advertisement that the content owner, say CNN, has on their channel. But as part of the agreement we have with the content owners, they give us some amount of time per hour, say one to two minutes, two to three minutes. So when we get our ad break, what will happen then is Media Tailor will look at the manifest, the ad stitcher, looks at the manifest, sees that an ad break is coming, and then it makes an ad call. And it calls, we have a proxy, uh, because we didn't want to connect. We wanted to be able to um, be, have some control over, in real time, where we're calling which ad server we want to work with, and logging, and all sorts of stuff. It's obviously a good idea to do. Um, and what we do is we choose among a set of, of ad servers or ad partners. Um, Freewheel, you've probably heard of. It's, a, it's a, owned by Comcast. It's a, it's a very popular, very big video ad server. Uh, SpringServe is a, uh, a lesser known, but a, an excellent ad server. Uh, APS is, is uh, Amazon's publishing system. They, they do buying. Um, and then the ad servers talk to you know, basically SSPs or other demand partners who figure out who has an ad and wants that specific person or that specific device or whatever. Um, then the ad slot is filled up with ads, um, basically links to ads. And that whole pile is then sent back up to Media Tailor, to the ad stitcher. Now, these are MP4s, right? They can't actually be inserted in an HLS stream because HLS has multiple variants at different bit rates. What the, the ad stitcher has to do is take the advertisements that came back from the, from the, the ad decisioning side of things, it has to transcode them. 
it has to turn them into the same variant rates that we have the mainstreams on, which means that for the first time it ever sees an advertisement, it can't show it, right? Because it hasn't transcoded. You can't retranscode them that fast. So it transcodes them, puts it into a CDN, and remembers that it's transcoded that ad. So the next time that ad comes through, which it will, um, the ad is ready to play, and it rewrites the manifest so that instead of getting the, the video chunks that are from the underlying stream, so CNN, um, it actually then just gives video chunks that are advertising chunks, right? So it's a seamless process. The player generally doesn't know what's going on. There, there's some variance to that. You can do, sometimes the player can do beaconing as well. But fundamentally, from a playback perspective, the player has no idea. It's just getting video segment, video segment, video segment. Video segments happen to switch from original content video segment to advertising segment. And then when there's a queue in, basically the, the, it's where the, the playlist service is saying, all right, ad break is over. You got to go back to content. Then Media Tailor stops doing anything and just, just keeps them flowing through. And that's really how server-side ad stitching works. Um, fairly simple in theory, um, but a lot of moving parts, a uh, lot, of, lot of things that can go wrong. Um, if any of you have, have worked with advertising technologies, um, they, they can be a mess, uh, and these are. So I think that was it in terms of the overall um, tech part of things. Yeah, and I, um, I guess the only thing I'll say is like, all of that that he just explained happens in between when you literally the game is on and then goes to halftime. Like that, that like little blip, all of that literally happens in the back end just to serve you the correct ad. So like it's a very, very quick process that needs to happen in order to stitch all of that together to serve you that advertisement. So I, I hope, I don't know, if it's just me, it's a really, really hard problem that happens super, super fast. Like he explained that over five, 10 minutes and that happens in like, like that. So it's just to put in perspective kind of like all of the moving pieces to do that. Sorry. So in terms of best practices, you know, we've been on this journey for a couple of years. Uh, we did what people, we didn't do what people normally do, which is do on-prem so they can control everything. Uh, as you can imagine, we're really sensitive to network. We're really sensitive to compute. We're really sensitive to storage latency. Um, but we did it all on the cloud, and I guess we have some best practices that, that we've learned. And I'll say together, because honestly, Google, when you're working with a cloud provider like this, they are your operations team or part of your operations team, whether you realize it or not. Um, and our relationship is to the point where uh, it really is a partnership. Um, I mean, that's really the, the last point here is, is they're not just a vendor, right? It, you shouldn't treat them like a vendor if it's something core to your business. Um, and they shouldn't treat you like a customer or just a customer. Right, you, you need to sort of be part of the same team. Um, we have weekly calls that they um, participate with us and with other third parties that we work with um, because we're so sensitive to things like network. Their networking team is on the call. It is not just the, the usual front-facing customer engineers. We can get deep into their teams because they have a vested interest in us succeeding. Um, other ideas is that, look, these cloud systems are built for general purpose use. They're not built for us, right? They're built for thousands of customers, multi-tenancy, a wide range of workloads. So, you know, test your use case, right? It's kind of obvious. Um, we're very sensitive to latency, and we have to design around some of the uncertainty and latency that we see in these cloud-based systems. Um, cloud systems behavior are subject to change. Um, sometimes, just due to failure, but that's not that interesting because everything fails. Um, sometimes it feels like the systems actually change their, their um, behavioral properties based on, on, I guess, load. Like we've seen normally we have no problem with hot keys in a data store and all of a sudden keys become hot keys and latency increases or fail, right? These are things you just have to be aware of will happen and it's due to other activities within the cloud um, because these are shared systems. Um, and then this idea for proprietary technology, choose carefully, right? Because what is a quick win today, like, oh, let me just use that because it's quick and I can get the system up, is, you know, next year's tech debt. Uh, and it's sometimes awfully hard to back out of these things. Um, we made a decision to go with BigQuery. I'm very happy with it. Uh, it is a proprietary lock-in kind of thing. We are kind of stuck. 
Um, we're not unhappy, we don't want to go. But if you think about what it would take to move all of this data out of, out of Google and to somewhere else, um, it's not a problem I even want to think about. Uh, I, I think that, do you have anything to add on yeah, the practices? I think, I think like what's, what was, just to kind of bring the point home was, we, when we get on, like we, we have these weekly calls, right? And like what is that weekly call? There's going to be like many different people that are all, always involved, right? Like all those partners that you saw, we'll have multiple calls with different partners. And it's just like really being aware of like the different services that are like segmented and who's all involved and where. And I think just being like an, an honest, open, transparent kind of, you know, not to be cliche, but devops -y and, you know, kind of culture and environment really helped, I think, like make us successful together because we understand that there's all these moving pieces and all these, you know, different parts and partners that are involved. And it's just about like kind of like together, like solving this problem and understanding where each each piece fits. Um, and I think like it really, really helped us like really both be successful yeah. and move really fast. Yeah. So, I mean, um, I think there are Google engineers that spend more time talking with some of our technical partners than I do. Yeah. Um, and it's true. And it, I, I think it's great because yeah. uh, they are world class experts in the things they're working on. Um, and they can really get to the root of a problem when, when there is one. And there are problems, right? There, yeah. there always will be. Um, I mean, that's our future. Um, we're trying to bring key core services in-house. We will continue to build more new things on, on the Google platform. Um, you know, multi-cloud, it's amazing that the marketing people let this through. Um, but it's one of the things we're doing, mainly driven by external forces, that there are, there are content streams that are coming into other cloud environments, not to Google. And we have to go over there to be able to receive them and encode them. Uh, and then, then we can bring things over. Um, we're going to continue investing in personalization. Uh, more markets, not just Spain. Uh, and then apparently there's something, something I know that he doesn't, which we're going to put Anything up Anything exciting? And, yeah, I'm not going to tell. All right. So. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, that's so, it. That's it. We left uh, a little less than 10 minutes, eight minutes, it says, uh, for any questions that you might have. Uh, if you could do the feedback, we really appreciate it. I think it's really important so we can kind of make sure if there's any, uh, anything to fix, change. We love, love uh, honest feedback. Uh, if you have any questions, the mics are there, line up. We'll be here about, yeah, seven, eight minutes left. So and we appreciate your time. I, I got one question on DVR. How are you dealing with massive parallel DVR recording? Lots of storage. It's, it's, a, it's a big expense. Um, but, but we have the... I mean, if you think about what a DVR recording is in the cloud, right, we, we have all the segments. They, they land, right, because we're, we're taking them off the encoders and putting them in. The DVR process happens in the background and makes copies, right? It's, it's, that's really how it works. And it's a large storage cost for us. We use different tiers of storage um, for this purpose, right, because uh, unlike the, the, front, the first line of um, storage for the CDN origins, which have to be fast, I wish they were faster, um, DVR doesn't have to be as fast. You can accept some latency when somebody hits play on a DVR. It can be pulled out of the sort of the near line storage and start playing. Uh, Google has an Envato service that checks a lot of the same boxes. Why not use them instead? Um, they, they have a suite of services. They have an encoding service, right? They have a, I think they have an ad stitcher. Um, they don't do what we do. They don't have the rights management. They, they don't handle the things that we needed to do to be able to um, license this content and uh, distribute it, right? Yeah. Like, I, these kind of services like Envato are, are and they were, they were pointed out on the original slide, by content owners, right? If I'm NBC, yeah. Like, I know exactly what I'm going to do and um, don't have to worry about licensing in the, way, in the same way we do because they are the ones that are putting the licensing constraints on us. So uh, I think it's a good set of building blocks. Um, we had to do something different fundamentally with playlist generation. Uh, and then honestly, um, given how sensitive we are to a good video experience, uh, we are trying to do more and more things like encoding in-house. So, if at least if something goes wrong, it's our fault, and it's something that we can fix. If it's a third-party provider, there's not a lot you can do sometimes. Just to clarify.
clar just to clarify a couple icons on the slide. Uh, I'm guessing that you use GCS for uh, video segment data storage, but I was curious what you use for the video stream metadata storage, if that's GCS or if it's faster or, or you mean like different the in the, any way. The manifests? Yeah, the manifest, yeah. So the manifests are, are they, they go in the data store right now because we need them uh, time ordered, right? Um, we are switching to a different system, which again preserves that time order. Um, we think it's going to be a basically, a, if you think about Kafka, is a time ordered list of stuff um, that is permanent until you roll it off the back. Um, it, it, that, that solves that problem as well. So we do it that way. So switching to Kafka then? Um, we, are, we are testing a solution that is based on a large Kafka cluster. I mean, it's a, it's a flat load input, right? Because you've got 800 channels or 1,000 channels. They have a completely predictable and stable load. Um, so that's actually easy to ingest and store. And the variable load is on, the, on the, the, the output. So how many people concurrent streams are coming in? Um, and it's an easy problem for something like Kafka because you confront it with a cache in front that keeps, say, the last 15 minutes of manifest in memory. And if everybody's watching the exact same program, it's not a problem. You're just pulling it out of RAM. Thanks. How did you get a server-side connection to DFP to do your uh, ad stitching on the, for your proxy? Sorry, I, I missed the question. Say it again. What did you have to do to get a server-side connection to DFP to include their ads in your stitching on your server-side? We, we just, so what happens is the ad server, the, um, what happens is, um, the, the ad stitcher makes the ad call to us. It goes to a, an ad server, just a conventional ad video ad server. And that makes a call to something like DFP. So um, that might be somebody is buying Roku. Like they really want to buy Roku impressions. They give us tags that come from DFP's ad server. We, our, our, our ad server will call that just to see, hey, do you want this? And it'll return either a vast or not. Um, that all gets packaged together and returned. So it's not like there's a connection between the ad stitcher and the demand partners directly. The ad server is making the calls to the demand partners uh, and going back. We don't use DFP as our ad server. Hello. Are you currently using or have plans to use any machine learning services for content delivery or ad delivery? We're experimenting on, on both of those. It's primarily in the area of, of sort of recommendation and similar. Um, but there are some interesting uses for detection of advertisement, um, detection of sentiment to understand what's happening in a game. If we could automatically know a game is going into overtime by understanding what the game action is or the clock or the scoreboard, um, it would make our lives a lot simpler, although it's a fairly sophisticated way to do it versus just having somebody watch it and hit a button. Right. Hey, um, if you have a critical failure in the ad pipeline, what does the experience look like for the customer? Do you try and fail in favor of them or? Sorry, in, in which pipeline? So this, this whole ad pipeline here, the thing that delivers yes. the, the adverts to the customer in some kind of break. Yep. If, if this has some kind of critical failure and you can't deliver those ads, what does the experience look like for the customer? Ah, this is actually the, the best failure mode we have. Because if you remember, we're, we're, so you're watching CNN. Right? CNN goes into an ad break. There's CNN ads there. CNN is putting advertising there. It's, a, it's the same stream you get on TV. So if there's a failure uh, to deliver, to get an advertisement, or to transcode the advertisement, then just the underlying stream just plays, and the user has no idea something happened. That's assuming the ad stitcher doesn't do something really stupid. Um, but it generally doesn't. Yeah. Hello. Is your ad stitcher having to decode and re-encode so that it can? Yeah. Yeah, so when an advertisement is first seen, so suppose it's a 30-second ad for Ford something, I don't know. Um, it has a unique identifier. It's usually just the URL for it, for the MP4. And MediaTailer keeps a list of all the advertisements that it knows about and has encoded. And if it's not on that list, it will run a transcode process in the same way we transcode the, the incoming stream, turn it into the bitrate variants that we're using um, so that uh, 
it, it, it can be slotted right into whatever bitrate stream um, the player is playing. Right? That means, of course, that the first time an ad is seen by, by the ad stitcher, it cannot be played to the user. And that's a case where there is that failure mode. We, we just don't show an ad, and the underlying stream is playing. Um, but, and I should have drawn it. I'm sorry. There should, there should have been a little loop here saying this is where the encoding happens. Um, but then once it has it and it's cached, it can, it can serve that ad next time. The decisioning system says show that ad.